Good evening, everyone. Our program will start shortly. Uh, we have just opened up the doors to our Zoom webinar for tonight. Thanks to the, the Historical Society of Santa Rosa for hosting tonight. We are allowing our participants to enter into the webinar and we'll get started in just a few moments. And more participants can join us as we are uh, in the event tonight. Thanks to those that are joining us right now on Zoom as well as Facebook Live. Tonight, the Historical Society of Santa Rosa is proud to present Carrillo Adobe, One Building, Many Chapters with Eric Stanley. And before we get going, I'll go over a few logistics. My name is Leslie Graves. I'll be your MC and your Zoom host tonight. We will have a question and answer period after the presentation. Our event will go until 7.30 and our presentation will be just about rounding up around 7 p.m. So we'll have about 30 minutes for a question and answer period. That is the time where you can ask your questions by keying them into the chat room. So tonight is much like an auditorium. Uh, Eric, our guest presenter will be up on stage and the spotlight will be on him. You get to sit back, relax. I hope you have a glass of ice cold water on this hot day. And when you have a question, go ahead and key that into our chat area. If you're joining us on Facebook, you can ask your questions in the comment area. And one of our administrators will be relaying that to our Zoom webinar. I will be facilitating the questions with Eric and getting his insights after his presentation. So thanks again for joining us. Before we get going, I also wanna do a proper introduction of Eric Stanley. Eric is the Associate Director and Curator of History at the Museum of Sonoma County. He works with the community and behind the scenes to highlight the incredible stories of Sonoma County's history. He is responsible for creating the historical elements of all ex exhibitions and helps oversee the museum's extensive permanent collection. He's a busy guy. He has curated exhibitions on everything from the history of the environmental movement to rock and roll in the North Bay. We're very excited to have him with us. Eric Stanley, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna cut out, I'll be on mute and uh, our participants won't be able to see me, but I'll be right here, ready to help. Great, well, thank you very much, Leslie, and, and good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, yes, I'm, I'm Eric Stanley, and I'm very uh, pleased to be here. Uh, in fact, I'm here at the museum uh, right now. And in addition to being the uh, history curator for the museum, I, I wrote my master's thesis on the Creo Adobe, well, oh, many, many years ago, <laughs> it seems. And I uh, wrote a historical section of the archaeological report on the Creo Adobe and the surrounding area in 2007. And I always so pleased to be able to revisit uh, this topic and come back to it because it's, uh, uh, you know, near and dear to my heart. And so I'd like to thank the Historical Society of Santa Rosa and uh, Larry Carrillo and Bill Turner and Leslie for, uh, for host having me here uh, this evening. I'm, I'm very uh, glad to be here. Um, and, but before uh, we get going uh, on the Creo Adobe, it, the Creo Adobe itself, I wanted to relate some thoughts just on the contemplation of the physical things of, of bygone eras, uh, you know, from my from my work at the at the museum. Um, here it here it is. Here's the the old post office in which the the museum is housed, which is, which is actually uh, a building itself that had to be saved uh, from destruction over over the years. Um, and at the museum, we have a collection of over 18,000 tangible artifacts, and frequently those things represent 
things that are no longer with us, whether they're buildings or neighborhoods or businesses or people, of course. So I spent a lot of time considering the, the physical materials and uh, tangible things and what they mean and why they might be important. You know, in many ways, these sorts of things are just markers or touchstones. They don't by themselves tell the whole story, right? And in this age in which we're reevaluating how we interpret our history and uh, look at historical things on the landscape, I think this is uh, a great time to do this uh, look at, at the Korea Adobe itself. Um, because they are in the end just things and they only take on the meaning that people are willing to give to them. And they only carry the stories that people take the time to attach to those, uh, to those physical things. Um, and actually in some of my original writing about the Korea Adobe, I, I compared it to a statue uh, that had lost its identity uh, over time, both through its declining physical condition as a building uh, and through the changing context that surrounded it and the fading in and out of the story that was told about that building uh, at any given time. So if we could go forward. Uh, and in 2017, I had a rather uh, kind of powerful experience, I guess you'd say, considering things that have been lost over time. Uh, it was the summer of 2017 when the Press Democrat actually ran an article uh, about the demise of efforts to save and restore the old Hogue House. Um, and actually we go forward one more um, here. Um, and then at the time that that came up, um, the, uh, that, that that article came up about finally the, uh, the abandoning of the attempt to save and restore uh, the Hogue House, it, it put in my mind um, kind of this idea of looking back at things that we've lost and what are the touchstones of our history and how do we preserve them and keep the stories with them. So let's see the, the next. Um, and here, here's a painting of, of the old Hogue House, the uh, butterscotch colored wooden house that uh, was at the end of, end of B Street that much like the Carrillo Adobe has been, had been through many efforts to save, restore, somehow preserve the building uh, that were ultimately un unsuccessful. Um, and next, we could go on. Um, there are objects here in the museum's collection that tell the story of Santa Rosa's Chinatown, which is a, another kind of landscape that's, that's gone away. Um, but that is so important for us to preserve the stories of, um, including stories of immigration and uh, the families were here of, you know, even the, the racism and oppression that went on against uh, Chinese people and all of those stories. Onward. Um, and the landscape of, of Fountain Grove, uh, the many buildings that were lost, including, uh, including the Round Barn. And then next. And of the people who were there, including the stories of uh, Kanaye Nagasawa, who you see on the upper left of the, uh, the Japanese, uh, immigrant winemaker who came to be the foremost person uh, at Fountain Grove. Uh, next. And uh, this is the, uh, actually on display again at the, at the museum if you uh, get a chance to come down, which is the door to the winery at Fountain Grove. The winery, which was torn down finally in about 2015, uh, was an object that we preserved from that landscape. Uh, and buildings that we lost in disasters, like buildings that were lost in the 1906 earthquake. And onward. As you can see here, the Athenaeum Theater that had collapsed in the earthquake. And then finally, just the last one, this painting of the uh, Taylor Resort, um, another building that has kind of, kind of left us. So I only, uh, and you can actually go to the, the oh wait, hold on one second. <laughs> before before we move on here, uh, that's okay. We'll we'll keep with that. And I only do this because uh, to to again to think about all the stories uh, and the what needs to be done to attach stories to uh, physical objects and how we keep stories alive and and what they mean um, and why they're why they're important. And so that's what uh, the the lost Santa Rosa exhibition did to me, and it certainly brought around 
my mind back to uh, the Korea Adobe and all of the efforts to, to keep alive the stories or to add to the stories and add to the, to the chapters about it. It's because uh, the Creo Adobe was also a physical thing that it teetered on the edge of being lost longer than just about anything else and a place that many peop people really look to attach the stories of Santa Rosa. And it has been like a statue on a changing landscape, losing its identity, losing its physical integrity uh, and the stories uh, and the changing stories that were attached to it at any one given time. And so tonight, my, my goal here is not to so much focus on the nuts and bolts, or maybe in this case, the mud and straw uh, that would be uh, the, the adobe itself. But I wanna talk about how the adobe has been considered over the years and what stories have been attached to it over time to help us consider its history. Um, you know why, and that is sometimes very revealing of why it has existed kind of in a state of limbo, never quite restored or fully preserved, or on the flip side, never fully raised from the landscape. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to go over uh, many of the stories. I'm, I'm like a, a, you know, a stone skipping over the pond here, of, uh, so not going deeply in depth on uh, any one thing. So forgive me of the things that I leave out. But really what I'm doing here is really telling you the story of the stories uh, of the Korea Adobe. <laughs> and if that's too meta for you, well, you know, there you go. <laughs> so, um, and maybe, uh, and maybe in some ways that's why I kind of, you know, I didn't come up with the greatest title for this present presentation, the, the idea of chapters, but I hopefully it brings to mind, you know, the, the many stories that are associated with building the layer of meaning and the different times and circumstances under which uh, the stories we tell about it uh, are told and why they're more prominent at one time or another. So, um, so here we go. Uh, you know, here's how we've known the building for many years, that the building was constructed in an L shape with a longer wing pointing out to the west and a shorter wing pointing to the south with the, these basic facts attached to the building. Um, at least in the way it has been largely told over the years, that it was built in 1837 or 1838, or maybe 1839 along Santa Rosa Creek to serve as the home and center of the Rancho Cabeza de Santa Rosa. The rancho was one of the 20 plus ranchos granted by the Mexican government within the modern day boundaries of Sonoma County. And in 1838 or so, it became home to Maria Carrillo, who recently widowed had traveled up from San Diego with at least six of her children still under her care to take ownership of the rancho as part of her effort, the efforts by her powerful son-in-law, Mariano Vallejo, to solidify his hold on the Northern frontier of Mexican California. Um, and for a mere eight years, it served as the ranch home uh, when the Bear Flag Rebellion and subsequent, subsequent Mexican-American War made California part of the United States, leaving the adobe an entirely new national cultural uh, context. And then falling into disrepair, the building became the subject of com conservation efforts going all the way back to 1937. And while more than one of these efforts resulted in improvements, roofs or protective enclosures, none has brought about the long-term preservation inter and interpretation of the building with such a long and rich history. And today it remains in limbo, still in possession of a, a developer whose attempt to build on the property and offers some level of preservation is still unrealized. Um, but it's really about these stories. So, so to start this off, I wanna go through three different ways of telling stories about the Adobe. Um, that'll kind of, I think, illustrate what I'm talking about here. So I'm going to share, uh, share one here. I'm gonna share a short video. So uh, that makes me a, a great grandson of Maria Carrillo. My grandfather, I can remember him, and I don't remember them speaking English. I think they could only speak Spanish because my aunt used to interpret what we'd say to them and then what they'd say back, why she'd tell us. And, and that's the way we 
communicating. This came from the old Karuru Adobe, and from what I've heard, it was brought up from the uh, oh, Tiburon, where the whale boats used to come around Cape Horn and they'd come into Tiburon before they went up to the Bering Sea. And uh, people from up in this section would trade meat and hides and tallow for uh, goods and stuff from the uh, boats that they brought around from the East Coast. And uh, this uh, was evidently came around, I know it came around Cape Horn. And as far as I know, they, they call them a hurdy gurdy. And uh, I always knew it as a music box or a hand organ, but uh, it uh, has been playing ever. <laughs> Well, and that was uh, that was Earl Carrillo, who uh, I have to say was one of my my first introductions uh, to to the Carrillo Adobe, um, and talking about it. And what he talked about in the video there was a little bit about sort of trade relationships and um, and uh, how the, the items that were in the Adobe. But he also what what you didn't see in the video too was that he kind of took a bit of a dim view of of his. The actions of Americans and uh, the overtaking of the Adobe and sort of the the the, the disruption to uh, his family's life and that was part of the story that he told from a particular perspective and so that's sort of part of the the Carrillo family lore and the uh, part of their memoirs and telling the the story of of the Adobe from a particular uh, perspective. And then my second example of stories that have been told uh, in relation to the Adobe, while not always connected directly to it, um, is the, the kind of origin story of Santa Rosa. And this idea, like in our first slide, the sign that says um, the place where Santa Rosa, you know, the place where Santa Rosa begin. So here is a version of a story uh, and probably its first appearance in 1875 in the, in the Sonoma Democrats. I'll just read this. Uh, quickly. Uh, the appropriate and beautiful name of the plains, creek, and town and, of Santa Rosa originated in the following manner, our authority being M.G. Vallejo, who was among the very first to visit this section and is more than anyone now living uh, familiar with the early history of Sonoma County. It is well known that the country was first occupied by the missionaries of the Order of St. Francis, whose object was to Christianize the Indians. The first missionary established establishment north of San Francisco was at San Rafael. Father Juan Amaros, who in 1829 uh, was Padre Ministro of the mission of San Rafael. Amaros was in the language of our informant, a model minister of the altar. In the year above named with a single companion, he left his charge on his tour northward, hoping uh, doubtless uh, to find some soul astray by which his daring and zeal might be brought uh, to the fold of the faithful in the bosom of his beloved church. And therein he describes the encountering of the, uh, the Indian maiden Rosa uh, in the creek and the sort of legendary telling and the baptism of uh, the Indian maiden Rosa and that being the namesake uh, for Santa Rosa. So that was told in 1875 with a kind of you know, air of romantic sense of, of the mission period. And then finally, uh, in example three here, uh, in 1951, at the dedication of St. Eugene's Cathedral, church officials sought to tie the site of the Creo Adobe to much older mission history, suggesting that old records of the ground on which St. Eugene's is built 
now show it to be in the general area where Mission Santa, Santa Rosa was situated. And in 1962, during a drive to, to raise money for the restoration of the Carrillo Adobe, the Santa Rosa Bishop at the time remarked, it is amazing how the missionaries were able to choose the best sites. And in their research report, uh, the Catholic Church cited that the baptism uh, of Rosa was well established and stated that two buildings had been erected at Santa Rosa to serve as an assistencia to the Sonoma mission. One was a residence and one was a chapel and that upon the arrival of Maria Carrillo, she with the help of her sons, Ramon and Julio restored the mission buildings and used them as her own. So these three stories show different approaches and each a different emphasis and set of values uh, at different periods of time uh, and the approach to looking at the history uh, of the Carrillo Adobe. So actually, I think we can go back to our slides. Oops, I have to, yeah. And here's a view uh, of the adobe uh, taken in the, in the 1930s as part of the Historic and American Buildings Survey. So again, these three stories show different areas of emphasis at different times and for different reasons. But undoubtedly, one of the lasting mysteries of the location of the Carrillo adobe and the structures are on it are its relationship to the missions of California. Uh, for at least 64 years, people, or, or more by now, have spent time conjecturing about the level to which the site was intertwined with the missions. And so I think, oops. So I think it's uh, really instructive to take a look back at how the, the mission system uh, kind of evolved and arrived in north of San Francisco Bay, which is kind of important to understanding uh, how the Carrillo Adobe and the site that it sits uh, could have become uh, intertwined with it. So quick, quick, very quick review <laughs> uh, on the missions we have uh, just for a timeline's sake. Uh, in San Diego, you have the mission established there in 1769, in Carmel in 1770, and in San Francisco, Mission Dolores established in 1776. And you may think that the mission conquest of the North Bay began with the founding of mission at San Rafael in 1870, or even the Sonoma mission in 1823. Uh, but really, I think it's instructive to see that, uh, as best we can tell, it began in 1783, uh, when two Coast Miwoks from a village along Richardson Bay were baptized at Mission Dolores. And the point of this is that uh, it, wasn't, it didn't require that there was a mission in Sonoma uh, for native people to be drawn out of the villages and into uh, the mission system. In fact, by the end of 1803, 41% of Mission Dolores population was Coast Weemock. And in 1816 and 1817, the majority of the Olampoli and Petaluma Coast Miwoks were, were uh, baptized. And they were split roughly between uh, Mission Dolores uh, and Mission San Jose. Again, the point being uh, the way the mission system progressed into the North Bay is not necessarily uh, directly through uh, the mission at Sonoma. And so it was in 1817 that Mission uh, San Rafael was established. And it's really as an outstation of San Rafael that Santa Rosa kind of comes into the, into the picture. Uh, in terms of the mission system. Um, in November of 1821 saw the final significant exploration under the Spanish flag uh, of the north, the northern kind of reaches north of uh, San Francisco. And on uh, December 27, 1821, uh, the first Santa Rosa Plain Southern Pomo person uh, was baptized at the mission San Rafael. So it's in this period of time in the 1820s that you have an accelerating uh, engagement with the, uh, the mission system uh, in, the, in the North Bay. And uh, in June of 1823, uh, well, in 1823, Mission Sonoma was finally given uh, official recognition, uh, but only with the understanding that neither the San Rafael mission nor Mission Dolores would be closed. Uh, 
but the, the southern Pomo of the Santa Rosa Plain would still continue to be drawn into uh, the San Rafael mission even after the establishment of the Sonoma mission. And 1824 would see a large wave of southern uh, Pomo baptisms uh, at San Rafael with a total of 182 Santa Rosa Plain Pomos who were baptized that year. And the wave of those baptisms, and here we kind of get to one of the important points, uh, culminated on September 3rd, 1824, in the main village somewhere along Santa Rosa Creek. And in his daily entries, Father Juan Amoros wrote, on the 3rd of September, 1824, finding myself in the village of Gualomi, the captain of that place, and Kasi, the captain of Jayomi, presented me with their people, among them various elders. I told them how good it would be if they were to make themselves Christians. They responded that they were not able to walk far because they were old, that they wanted to be baptized right there, and they were given basic instructions, and their village was given the name of Santa Rosa de Lima in Gualomi. And this is the first use of the place name Santa Rosa and what really put the name uh, essentially on the map, so to speak. And uh, this is the actual account of the naming of Santa Rosa, unlike the somewhat mythologized version about the, the Indian maiden uh, Rosa. And I have to, to note here that it was uh, the work of, of Randy Milliken um, who turned up that record uh, finally, because people had searched for it for a long time, a long, long time, um, and had, had eluded everyone, frankly, over the years until uh, Randy had discovered that in 2009, working on the Creekside Archaeological Report. Um, and so while it's not exactly clear what was happening uh, at the at this site where the site of Gualomi uh, in the years uh, 1827 or 1828, it is clear that, that the site became a Mission San Rafael Ranch. And you can see that uh, it, it's mentioned in the records. Um, and the map we're looking at here actually is the uh, shows two different sites. And I think this is the most kind of important point uh, to make on this, uh, this question of the, the 1820s and 18s. Uh, 30s uh, and the Korea Adobe's connection uh, to the missions. So on the right you have the the kind of red or pinkish square which indicates what is the site of the Korea Adobe and then uh, the the little square in the Hama, there you are. <laughs> and then on the left you have the indication of the uh, J. Smith uh, property and these are sort of the the, the two sites that come up in these kind of, uh, in the baptismal records and the early records that are talking about uh, the proselytization of uh, that that's going on in this era. And it's not always clear and you can't tell which site is which and who's talking about what and, and what buildings uh, are where. Um, but it's clear that some buildings were built at these sites. Um, but it leaves us lots of mysteries about what was uh, what was where. And so this is just an image of a, of a, a Pomo um, woman uh, gathering, gathering seeds. And what uh, an important point that I want to make here as we go over uh, through this is the idea of uh, Native people and their agency and even resistance uh, to what was going on in this period of time. And in the 1830s, I, I want to uh, uh, read a quick, uh, a quick quote here. Um, and this was in a time in which uh, Mariano Vallejo and uh, the California governor were looking to establish an, another settlement um, up in the, in the northern reaches here of uh, north of San Francisco Bay. And uh, what I'm, so the quote here is, this is from uh, the governor, uh, Figueroa, who was here scouting along with Vallejo. Uh, we continued on our march at eight in the morning through the valley we called Sonoma, where there runs a permanent stream. At two, we arrived at a spot called Santa Rosa, situated in another larger valley, which has a permanent stream crossing it. Here we were met by 150 Indians who belong to various villagers. They have a leader named Daniel, a Christian renegade who anticipated our visit and did not refuse to recognize the government if it allows them to remain in their land. We traveled six leagues. 
And the likely location uh, of this encounter uh, was three miles to the west or so of the Creo Dobi, which was uh, indicated on, on the map um, previously. But the important point here, uh, and then Daniel, the person who's referenced there, was actually baptized at San Rafael in 1825. And in those records, he's identified with his Indian name as well, which was Minichugu, and identified as a, a Chagwalomi headman and was now the Forestville area along the Russian River. And the point of what I'm saying here is the kind of fluidity of the northern frontier. There were uh, Native peoples who were both in the mission system and out of the mission system and considered uh, renegade by the, uh, by the authorities in there, but the, but the point is that they had their own uh, agency and were taking action. And to me, this is one of the most fascinating uh, um, areas in which to that research should continue and the important stories of these people uh, need to be told because they have a history that's not um, fully fleshed out there. So, um, so I hope that it, that kind of gives a picture of what was happening in the 1820s and this attempt to extend the mission system uh, into the North Bay, but it's still very difficult to understand exactly where, where structures are and where everything is happening in any sort of precise, precise way. So, um, and here, and oh, off to, so we noted on that previous map, the sort of two different sites. One, the one that was on the right side, that was uh, the Carrillo Adobe, and then uh, the other on the left side, that was the site of uh, probably that early uh, baptism and, um, and the sort of uncertainty about what's at each of those sites. And so this is actually the, the diseño, uh, the map that was put in for application for the land grant of the Rancho Cabeza de Santa Rosa uh, by Maria Carrillo. And it kind of reflects in probably uh, those similar two sites. If you look at uh, uh, more on the right side where it says notes the corral and more on the left side where it says Casa Nueva uh, and the Temescal. And here, here's a, another uh, quick quote from uh, the 1880s. Uh, it is said at the time of the occupation of the valley by Senora Carrillo, there were 3,000 Indians living in the neighborhood of the present city. The principal rancheria was on the Smith farm just below the bridge at the crossing of Santa Rosa Creek. Um, Upon a site, this a mission was commenced, probably by Father Amoroso, whose zeal in the cause of Christianity kept him always on the debatable line between the natives and La Gente de Raison, as the Californians were called or called themselves. Um, the Indians rose up and destroyed the incipient mission buildings about the same time that the mission uh, of Sonoma was devastated. And uh, there's reports that there were still, uh, even when the Carrillo family arrived, in the more western site, still evidence of uh, um, foundations or the sites of foundations. So, all right, let's 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 go to the next slide. And this uh, zeroes in on one of the, on that site, uh, that as it's indicated on the, uh, uh, on the Desenio, again, the, the map that was put in for permission uh, to claim the land. And here we have two items, the Casa Nueva or, you know, the new house and the Temescal, which is a, a native uh, steam hut house um, in essence or building. So, so again, these things remain kind of fog. What is, what is the new house? It, it becomes unclear um, as to what exactly is what. So, um, so in, in 1838, Maria Creo applied for permission to claim the land, uh, as I said, through the, the, through the application of the map. And uh, the, as I said, the diseño is ambiguous, showing a Casa Nueva to the west and the corral and a estancia or a ranch building to the east. But where was the Creo family home intended to sit initially? And might the plans have changed? Uh, during the process of applying for the land grant. Those things are certain, certainly a possibility. Um, and here we have, here's one of my favorite, one of the more intriguing uh, images we've encountered. This is from a set of 
daguerreotypes that were collected from Sonoma that some of which definitely show uh, the Carrillo family uh, and are confirmed. And then this one, which has the intriguing possibility that the, the woman on the left is Maria Carrillo and it would be the only image of her. It's most definitely not a confirmed uh, identification, but it's sort of tantalizing. So I wanted to have this uh, image up uh, and read this sort of description of, of Maria Carrillo. Uh, written by uh, the merchant and trader William Heath Davis in 75 years in California. Doña Maria Ignacia was ambitious and cultivated large fields of wheat, barley, oats, corn, beans, peas, lentejas, and vegetables of every variety. I have eaten from water and muskmelon of a hot summer day in the broad corridor of the home-like adobe dwelling. I have seen Doña Maria Ignacia robed in neat calico dress of French texture with a broad-brimmed straw hat mounted on a horse uh, which had been uh, broken to the saddle by some of her sons expressly for her use and rode over the hacienda and direct the Gentiles in sowing and planting seed and in harvesting the same. She supervised the farming herself, but the management of the stock and rodeos was left to her son, Jose Ramon and his brothers. Jose Ramon inherited his mother's gifts. And so uh, that's, a great description of the adobe itself and Maria Creo uh, there. So, and so, and then, and this image comes from the, as I mentioned early, earlier in my very brief synopsis of, of the adobe, for so long it was viewed as the uh, kind of, an, only as an L shaped building. Um, with nothing that had been necessarily built around it. And this comes, this is the magnetic uh, resistance imaging that came from the archeological excavation uh, that was done at the site in the 2000s. And it indicates uh, more than that, including large stone uh, footings that were probably bigger than anything that were intended for a building that was bigger than anything that was ultimately built on it. So again, this leaves us in a uh, quandary over the two sites. Were, were there mission buildings there? Was there a mission building that was supposed to be built there and then was not? Um, but it remains kind of uh, uh, mysterious as to what was intended uh, to be at, at each of those two sites. But we do know that Maria Creo then established her, her ranch, the Rancho Cabeza de Santa Rosa, and the family lived at that site uh, beginning in the very late 1830s. Um, all right, I think we can. And there's another picture of the excavated, the larger stone footings that reveal um, that something more may have been intended to be built upon that site. All right, if we can. Uh, all right, and this gets us uh, kind of to uh, the next chapter, which is the American period. Uh, the Bear Flag Revolt and the uprising of American occupants of California who lived uh, in the Pueblo of Sonoma uh, and declared their support for a government that would leave unshackled by fetters commerce, agriculture, and mechanism. And then the subsequent Mexican-American War, of course, brought uh, California under American control. Um, and as I alluded to in uh, Earl Carrillo's story, Carrillo family lore suggests that Maria Carrillo, greatly frightened by the events of the Bear Flag Rebellion, rode to Tamales Bay, hid herself among the foliage surrounding the water, and her exposure caused her to get ill, uh, and which turned into pneumonia, eventually causing her, her death in 1849, according to uh, that story. But after her death, uh, when the rancho was divided up um, amongst her children, uh, the adobe itself was left to Juana de Jesus, who's pictured here. Um, and she continued to live at the uh, adobe uh, and married David Malig, an Irish sea captain and merchant, and a uh, keeper and owner of a wharf, uh, or, or a wharfinger, which is not a, you know, I don't know how many people are familiar with that phrase, but the owner <laughs> or keeper of the wharf, who converted a section of the Carrillo home into a general store. And with partner Donald McDonald, the couple also operated an inn. So the adobe then briefly served in the American context, briefly served as a post office, um, all at the center of a town, but not Santa Rosa, the town, the short-lived town of Franklin. 
but uh, the Carrillo Adobe had been transformed. So in just a few short years, uh, the building had gone from a California family home at the center of a productive ranch to a general store, post office, tavern and inn, and further transformation was already on the horizon. The partnership of Barney Hohen, Theodore Hammond, William Hartman, in concert with Juana's brother, Julio Carrillo, uh, pulled together the land and filed a map for the new town of Santa Rosa. So not only had the adobe been quite rapidly converted, it would now be left on the outskirts of a growing community as the short-lived town of Franklin was moved to the west and this town of Santa Rosa established and would become the focus of growth and development. So uh, if we can move forward, yeah. So the uh, adobe ended up uh, on the, as uh, owned by the Hammond family and amongst the orchards uh, that were soon planted uh, out there. And this, uh, this image from the 1870s or 1880s kind of indicates uh, the evolving usage of the adobe as does the next image uh, where you can see farm equipment and uh, the changes that were, uh, some of the changes that were made to the building. If we can then move forward. And uh, kind of in, in another chapter of this, the later 19th and early 20th century featured a significant waves of romanticism about the Spanish and Mexican past of California, uh, among the now um, you know, American inhabitants. From the emergence uh, of the aforementioned naming of Santa Rosa in 1875, um, there were a number of things that were, uh, that were happening on that added to the sort of romantic notions about the uh, the past time period. Uh, the novel Ramona was published in 1884, which provided a kind of idyllic look at, uh, romanticized look at Southern California and uh, um, the missions and, and the, those sorts of things. The 18, and then in 1894, the Sonoma Democrat wrote uh, uh, this, this short piece, Santa Rosa has decided to hold a rose carnival this is a fact when, that when our enterprising city gets down, to oh, gets down to facts, it does not take a back row to any competitor. All of the principal cities in the southern part of the state have gone to no small trouble and expense to attract Eastern people. So there, um, and then in 1896, the Sonoma Democrat also wrote, the Rose Carnival is billed as the Fiesta of Santa Rosa. And it's another place in which they make uh, much of the story, the romanticized story of uh, Rosa, uh, the converted uh, Indian maiden in the naming of Santa Rosa. So the point of this uh, is that the romanticized and kind of nostalgic versions of the past were really a dramatic flip uh, from the lead up to the American takeover and the early, early American period when the Hispanic uh, California past was really marginalized Adobes were boarded over and the perspective tended to be that American industry was far superior and there were plenty of racist tropes that abounded that featured sort of uh, the laziness of the previous occupants of the land. So this romanticized version was a, really a flip uh, or a definite change from previous years, but clearly geared to draw tourists and attract uh, tourist dollars. And in fact, the Fiesta of Santa Rosa and the, the Rose Festival is the origin of uh, Santa Rosa's Rose Parade. So, and here, uh, so, so in uh, continuing on along those lines in 1924 was the dedication of the State Route 1 and also happened to be the year that Grace Hudson painted Rosa the First Convert, which is the painting uh, pictured here. And then in uh, 1936, the Department of the Interior completed a historic American building survey of the Carrillo Adobe, along with other historic buildings like the chapel at Fort Ross and the Sonoma Mission. In October of 1937, the State Park Commission advocated for the completion of the restoration of the Sonoma Mission. And on October 9, 1937, at the 17th Annual Redwood Empire Association Convention assembled at the Sonoma Mission Inn, the stated goal of the gathering of representatives from the counties, uh, from the nine counties of Northern California was to make the Redwood Empire a year round Mecca for tourists. And the chair of the convention, A.R. Grinstead, emphasized an all Spanish program of entertainment, 
in keeping with the motif and atmospheric background of the convention. So really that here the timing, the timing was ideal, the stage was set and the press Democrat took up the Adobe's cause printing an article that began like this, humble and neglected and all but forgotten. Santa Rosa's earliest historic landmark is on the verge of complete devastation. Soon, unless something is done about it, the ravages of time will wipe out the existence of a picturesque structure symbolic of California's early history. So thus began the old Adobe Fund, fund which apparently failed to reach the stated goal of $500. And the original intent was to add a roof, but no roof was added. And in 1943, uh, the owner at the time, Paul Haman, passed away um, and left the adobe to his wife. And in 1944, heavy rains, uh, remember those, maybe we'll have those again at some point, uh, destroyed, destroyed the western wing of the adobe as the dilapidated roof at the time collapsed. Um, actually, and if you could, uh, move forward. And these are just more of the historic American building survey. Oh, this is my backdrop. Yes. <laughs> the Habs photograph. Again, showing the, the L-shaped building. And then onward. Yes. And this a, a great interior shot in which you can still see the, the muslin, muslin that would have been tacked to the interior walls and some of the detail on the inside of the building. Um, but by, but by 1946, uh, the developer, Hugh Cotting, had a small division, uh, subdivision near Santa Rosa and purchased land to begin another. And on borrowed money, Cotting built a small shopping center called Town and Country Village, which he sold to an investor for $100,000. And with the money, he bought the Haman Orchards in 1949 and began construction on a larger shopping center. But he didn't purchase the Carrillo Adobe. Rather, it and the 17 acres uh, around it were given by the Haman family uh, to the Roman Catholic Archbishop of San Francisco in 1950. And here, this, um, well, in 1950, St. Eugene's Parish was established too in Santa Rosa as part of the archdiocese, uh, which constructed St. Eugene's Cathedral in 1951. Uh, in 1960, the church established the Diocese of Santa Rosa, and the parcel containing St. Eugene's was handed over to New York, the new organization. But some 800 feet to the east, amid the fading remnants of the Haman's orchards, sat the Carrillo adobe. And this is actually a, a limited archaeological excavation that was uh, uh, done probably in the late 50s, or might even be in the 60s, uh, probably at the behest of the church, um, who, as I referred to earlier, had interest in the, uh, the uh, mission past of, of the Carrillo adobe and tried to generate some interest in the building at, at that time. And in, uh, this is probably from the, the, I think, from the 70s. In 1975, riding the wave of the upcoming uh, bicentennial, national bicentennial, interest was renewed in the, in the building and the city of Santa Rosa made some overtures. And the church was open to them to some extent uh, to acquire the building, uh, but they were really looking for a clear path uh, to develop the property and no deals were reached at that time. And in the 1980s, the adobe uh, continued to melt away. The church had succeeded in building a roof, but that collapsed in 1981. Um, luckily, the adobe received assistance from the newly formed Friends of the Carrillo Adobe in 1986, consisting of interested citizens and teachers and descendants of Maria Carrillo. Uh, the project and uh, partly stimulated even by the project of a local student, a nine-year-old student who'd written a paper asking, well, what is that uh, building sitting there out in the field? Uh, uh, this energy was stimulated and the friends of the Creo Adobe uh, were formed. And around that time, another offer from the city uh, was made for the site. Um, city manager Ken Blackman was involved in an offer to the church, but negotiations uh, didn't go forward. Uh, at the time. And then uh, kind of in the last stage of this, uh, Barry Swenson Builders, a San Jose based developer bought the property, uh, just a shade less uh, than 14 acres from the Catholic Church uh, in the early 2000s. The firm's preservation of the adobe ruins and the park development that was planned for it uh, were a negotiated requirement for approval of the company's 
uh, uh, Creekside Village development along Montgomery Drive. And then in July of 2016, um, through the efforts, actually through the efforts of some of the Historical uh, Society of Santa Rosa uh, people, the, uh, the building was um, made eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. And the building still remains uh, with Barry Swenson builders. And uh, what I understand is that recently there was a new law that actually allowed for stalled developments to seek expedited reapproval um, partly because of the pandemic and desire to, to stimulate uh, development, but that that proposal, proposal has been uh, recently de declined to fast track uh, the development. Um, and so I think we can go, oh, and that, that's just a, a reiteration of the, uh, um, so we can actually move, go ahead and move forward from there. And even beyond that, I'm sorry, I <laughs> repeated a couple, couple slides. Um, and here's the, the building today. And kind of to, to kind of wind up um, what I've been saying, maybe, maybe part of this, uh, again, what I've been telling you is more about the story of the stories that have surrounded the building. And maybe it's realizing that there's no single and simple narrative um, about such a complex piece of, of history, uh, but that it's a resource that keeps revealing its story, you know, a piece at a time. It's an archive sort of in and of itself. Um, now, not just an artifact of its construction and early history, as some people have considered it, but now it's really a, a, a touchstone of so many of the stories that we tell you know, about Santa Rosa and how we reflect on its history. So while it's lamentable that we haven't come to a place where the adobe is preserved and thoroughly interpreted uh, for the benefit of the community, I'd like to at least note that we're trending uh, in the right direction in terms of exploring the history and stories that uh, surround the adobe. Because even in the time that I've been uh, considering it and reading about it, so much has happened. So if you look back across the years, we see a growing body of knowledge and one that is more inclusive and broad-based and looking at uh, native history and a variety of other things more in depth. So while we shouldn't at all give up on the idea of some state of preservation and interpretation that, uh, at the site, uh, we might acknowledge all the efforts to find a way to preserve the story of the Carrillo Adobe, um, from Gay LeBaron's series of columns to the friends of the Carrillo Adobe, to the archeologists, researchers, and historians, um, those who nominated it to the National Register, uh, ethno-historians, and all of that's all very exciting. Um, and the chapters are adding up. And it really isn't just as simple as the place where Santa Rosa began anymore. So thank you. That's the conclusion of my talk. And I am more than happy to take questions. And thank you, Eric. Really appreciate uh, just an abundance of information right there. I'm going to bring myself back onto the screen here and uh, join you for this Q&A time. I want to remind all of our participants that uh, Eric is here. We're going to keep this going until about 730 if we have enough questions to make to manage that. And um, you are more than welcome on Zoom to key in your questions in the chat area. And if you've joined us on Facebook Live, uh, on our simultaneous broadcast on Facebook, you can have your questions inputted into the comment section and one of our administrators on Facebook will be keying them in here on Zoom. So uh, one of the first questions I have actually came to me uh, a, a while ago, was it, it was prior to this uh, Zoom uh, broadcast. People were very interested in the Creo Adobe, as you know, um, I'm sure that you get questions about it even at the museum from time to time. Um, and one of those questions that I received was from Nancy Frost. Uh, she said that her husband's great, great grandfather, um, Alonzo Meacham, opened a store in the Adobe. And I uh, recall you mentioning a general store was in the Adobe. Uh, during that kind of uh, Americanized time. And she 
she said that she assumed that her family lived uh, in, in the adobe proper uh, at, and on the property, but wasn't quite sure. And she'd love to know, is that something that you would know or be able to point her in the right direction to find out? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I'm not exactly sure uh, what the sort of division of space was, but yes, that's right, that, that they operated a number of things in such a short uh, time period too. And that's one thing to, to emphasize too. You're, you're talking about, uh, you know, periods of time from, you know, say 18, you know, 49 up until 1854. So it's barely, you know, it's such a, a small period of period of time. Um, and that's one thing to keep in mind. And actually, a lot of these pieces, we're not talking about vast, uh, you know, periods of time. So I don't actually know the specifics of that. I don't know what the store looked like or what the uh, division of the space looked like. In that in that kind of really narrow narrow time frame. So uh, unfortunately, I don't I don't have the specific, uh, and I'm not a, not sure. You know, uh, I think I showed a couple drawings. You can look at the. Uh, you can understand how uh, the um, the building sort of divided, but you'd I think you'd have to pour over uh, a number of accounts. And I don't know if there's one that directly addresses the way you know the building was used. Um, other people might know out there. I, I have not seen one that okay. gets at that that aspect of it. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, it's it, it's fascinating. And like you said, these really short time periods that the building and the grounds were used for these different functions. So you can see how easily the some of this history is is lost it's exactly right? yeah and i think yeah. it's, it's sometimes you're well this must have been this way for hundreds of years we're talking about very short time frames um you know a, a decade or less sometimes when you're uh, some aspects of, of the history here so I, I think that is an important thing to, to keep in mind yeah 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 well thanks for that information and uh nancy thanks for your question i'm sorry we didn't have an answer for you tonight uh hopefully uh, your the path forward, you'll be able to discover that information. Um, the, do you have a question here from our Zoom chat? Do you know of any um, funds or endowment that is currently paying for the upkeep and restoration of of this Adobe? And uh, you know, it over the years, it's it's been really neglected. Obviously, you've gone through the history of of you know, who is actually owning and, and the city trying to uh, actually claim it or, or buy it. But right now, where, where, does, where do we stand? Well, it, it's, it's in the hands of, of uh, that developer. So um, that's my understanding that it's owned. I, I don't know if there's, um, you know, I mean, so much to of the, the history are, are people, you know, like, like Larry, who, yeah. who, who invited me first, who, who uh, volunteered and, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of care and upkeep. I don't know of a foundation that, that supports it because it's in, you know, and uh, I didn't go into it a lot, but, you know, a lot of this, you know, you, you're, you're dealing with things that are in private hands, even, even back in 1937, when they tried to, uh, the, the Press Democrat launched the, the old Adobe Fund, there were questions of sort of, well, why would I, you know, uh, put my money towards this? Why doesn't the guy who owns <laughs> doesn't hum and uh, uh, fix it up and do something with it? So we, we have lots of questions of, um, you know, private property and who owns it and what their intentions are. And that's a, that's a big part of the kind of tragedy, you know, if you want to call it that, of, of the story of that uh, timing is everything, right? Um, when, uh, in, in looking at it to me when the when the church is interested uh, you know in in doing something with it and looking at it historically the city is not and then when the city is interested you know and those things never quite coincide in a completely um, you know um, doubling of effect you know to to to, to really a accomplish something and so um, I think that's part of the the sense of the story of, of this building so a, a, a little bit of a bad relationship, um, yeah. <laughs> as, as things, as, as as it may be over over a course of time. 
Um, and you mentioned that it was a, you know, the Historical Society of Santa Rosa had applied for it to become a national landmark uh, or a historical landmark. Um, do you know that, do we know the status of that at this well, point? Well, I think, uh, and well, someone in your group probably can yeah. correct me and, and say it uh, uh, better than I can, but my understanding is that was a, uh, an eligibility hurdle and not, you know, the final hurdle. So uh, basically it was deemed worthy <laughs> but it hasn't uh, been been officially added, so I think that's the the status of it. So it's in it's in process. Yes, and so I, and I'm not sure what it requires to carry forward, uh, you know, to get that to the to the next level or what what that means. So I have a, I have a feeling someone's probably entering that information in the chat probably yes. right <laughs> now. But we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna try to keep up with some of these questions here, um, and 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 actually. Uh, a fantastic individual, Mr. Bill Turner, who uh, helps to organize these events, uh, did, did ask if you can address any contribution that Mar Becker had to protect the adobe. Do, do you recall that information? Um, no, Becker being the, uh, the church official? Who, who are we talking about? Well, we'll see. Uh, Bill might clue us in. So Bill, let us know. Um, a little bit more specifics around a question. We'll get back to you on that one. Um, and then I'm gonna, Pete has kind of given us quite a bit of information right here. I'm just gonna actually read his contribution to the chat area. He talks, yeah. um, there's, a, there's a translation of the request by Maria Creo in late 1834 to purchase a specific site in Sonoma east of the Sonoma mission, uh, the request was to Governor Figueroa and not to her son-in-law. She owned, um, you know, so this might be a little bit, just more adding some more information into your presentation. She owned this property for several years and most likely lived there and her family, with her family after their arrival from San Diego and before her move to Santa Rosa. And- um, Oh, well, that's actually very interesting. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that because there are a couple details that I didn't go into about other buildings that are thought to have been uh, one called Salvador's Adobe um, that was near the Creo Adobe that was thought to be the site where they lived before, while, while the, the main house was constructed. So, but it's always been a very murky and uh, so I think that's, that's really interesting to hear. Um, so yeah, and Maria Creo's different properties, I didn't go into it uh, either, but it's, um, her property in San Diego is also sort of a fascinating, um, element because she she wrote letters uh, uh, back asking about her garden um, and how much you know she cared about it in 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 San Diego and that it was being uh, preserved um, and there's some really interesting uh, correspondence and so I'd be really fascinated to to see um, uh, to see that that communication and um, understand the intent I was not aware of it so. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. There you go. The, we have a very, very engaged and very involved uh, participants here on the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's uh, webinar series and, and, and always great additions of information as well. Um, Bill did say yes, that this was Monsignor uh, wow. Becker, the priest at St. Eugene's, that he, that he was inquiring about um, if you know, if there was any contribution from him uh, and the church to protect the adobe, or you had you had, you had mentioned and it wasn't a slight well, to the church, was, but you said it was more about development, a little uh, the interest. Yeah, well, right? well, they did. I mean, what I know about, and I can't keep the 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 officials and the names in their in their right time slots, but they. <laughs> they did succeed in the, the church in the in the 60s in, in raising money and putting it into okay. the roof uh, yeah. that, um, that then collapsed in, in 1981. That was uh, then subsequently the Friends of the Carrillo Adobe formed and um, um, worked on preserving it. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. So so there potentially there was some some want to make it a little bit, last a little bit longer, make it a little bit more sustainable. Um, oh, there, Brian, I see Brian's uh, clarification on the, uh, 
Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll get we'll get to that. Um, yeah. So and I see that also uh, when asking about the the National Historic Landmark, um, you know, those that want more information and maybe to get involved with that, the Historical Society of Santa Rosa, I'm sure, is a great uh, you know resource. Uh, in helping to preserve and create those landmarks. So we'll, we'll give you some information about uh, how to contact them at the end of our presentation and Q&A. Um, and so uh, Ray Johnson, who is one of our, one of our famous historians right here, uh, right? Ray, Contributors. Yeah, yeah he's, he said it's very interesting that that possible photo of Maria Creo uh, who was the other person in the photo? Well, you know, here it's, this is a tricky one. So I've, I've seen that photo pop up on, uh, maybe even on Wikipedia as sort of definitively identified as Maria Creo. And, and it, it shouldn't be because it's still uh, doubtful, but it was from a collection of daguerreotypes that was, I think, acquired in an estate sale in the Sonoma area by a really serious uh, kind of photo collector. And so there were some, um, it's, it's not clear. I even took uh, several of the, the, those images to the Oakland Museum who are very good uh, photography experts. And they tried to you know, talk about the posture and the stance and you know, what, what does that mean to their relationship? So a number of the other daguerreotypes that were in that collection are very clearly uh, Maria Creo's daughter, some of the daughters, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, Juana de Jesus that I showed in the in the other daguerreotype. So those are more definitively identified. That pair is not, I mean, you can, you can go crazy trying to compare because we're so used to seeing the, the other existing photos of the daughters are them much, much older. And so you can look at them and you can be like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was, but there's no uh, definitive. Uh, so there's a good possibility it, it could be uh, uh, one of one of her daughters. So you can pull up the older photos and do some comparison, Ray, and see see what you think. <laughs> but that's about as far as you can get. There's nothing. There's not. It's not a definitive thing uh, because also since Maria Carrillo died in 1849, that puts uh, a lot of pressure on the timeline to have a daguerreotypist. So if you look at how that lines up with the early part of photography and whether there was a daguerreotypist in the area at that time. So it becomes a, a kind of tricky puzzle to see uh, how likely it is that that, mm. that could be her um, and then maybe one of the daughters, so. Well, we've got some, we do. might have some inside, inside information here from Lawrence Creo is in the chat room and uh, with us tonight and, and saying the other person in the photo might be Ramona. Um, so, uh, you know, these mysteries, these photos, right? You know, it speaks to right now, actually, uh, dating, dating photos and um, also saying who it, are in photos. Photos are so important, right? We hear about that from our fire survivors right here in Santa Rosa. We hear about it historically. We have the Sonoma County archives right now that are, uh, you know, kind of furled in, in this debate of who's going to actually be responsible for the Sonoma County archives. Um, and maybe that's just a good sign for us to, to remind everybody to put the names with the photos, right? <laughs> Whether it's online right, right, or it's digitally or, yes. it's, uh, it, or it's actually in hard copy form, date, date your photos, put the names <laughs> with the photos, put a little context so the next generations know, uh, you know where that photo, why the photo happened, where the photo happened, all of these kinds of things. The, you know, this, is, this, this could be an inspiring moment for a lot of people to, yes. um, Take, take this time to, to get organized a little bit. Um, and- well, Yes, and, well, and also of, of the things, um, and as I was trying to imply in the, in the first part of my presentation, that there, we have many things, whether it's a photo or an artifact or a historic building that's sitting out there, all of those things have these kind of rich stories to tell and there's a real reason to preserve them and to preserve their their stories. I think they are important. You alluded to the time we're in. I think 
a time of pretty intense evaluation of what history looks like and what symbols of history and what they mean. Um, and that's an ongoing and important process. And if you lose things, you can't go back and, and because history, I think, is this process of evaluating. It's never a static thing where you're always doing it. You're always learning more. And that's, isn't that what's great about it? So you don't want to lose those resources that we can look back at and understand our past. So great point. Great point. And, and, and to that point, um, this resource, this webinar, uh, and, and the recording of this webinar will be made available on YouTube uh, after this presentation. Um, so, uh, and that link will be available on the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's website uh, if you haven't visited their YouTube page yet. And you can also find all of these webinar um, series videos uh, have been recorded and they're placed on the YouTube page if you are someone who frequents Facebook, uh, that Facebook Live uh, broadcast is also ma maintained on Facebook as a recording if you go to the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's Facebook page and check out all of their videos. So uh, just a great time to, to uh, give that information and also answer a question that was in there as well. So I love how everybody is conversing on the chat. Um, so I'm trying to pick out the questions here. Uh, but I am, uh, Sylvia, you know, you're, I think Sylvia, you are going to become a board member on the Historical Society of Santa Rosa, um, because right there, you, you've let us know you're a full-time library technician at Maria Creo High School. So, so you've got, <laughs> you've got a path forward, let me tell you, we're going to get you involved with the Historical Society. So, um, Facebook, it looks like they're just watching. It is hot, folks. We know that it is hard to, to sit in front of a computer tonight and, uh, and deal with the heat. We, again, we hope that you're hydrating and uh, that you've got your cold water right there. We've got um, some more information from Pete. Uh, there are letters at the Bancroft Library that comprise part oh. Yeah. of the correspondence between Vallejo and yeah. uh, Father Quijas uh, in 1839 yes. to establish a mission in Santa Rosa right. and be associated. So it sounds like you kind of know this. To be associated, yeah. I'm going to just share it for everybody so that um, those aren't on chat can hear this. And be associated with a ranch to be established on the ranch of De and Guillocos. Uh, in 1839 after the final date of all secularizations of the missions as it came to be. Uh, and, and Pete has uh, presented this information at the California Missions Foundation yeah. at a conference a few yes. years ago. Yeah, I did. That's great. And that's fascinating stuff. And uh, it's something I didn't go into uh, deeply, otherwise we'd be here all night long, because there's also, you know, the, the other, uh, what he's pointing out to is how complex the period of time is, because there are multiple um, possibilities um, to explain um, the foundations that are at the, the Carrillo Adobe site. And one of those could be potentially, I mean, it's a little bit of a stretch timeline, but the uh, Vallejo's, uh, Vallejo's uh, attempt to create this uh, post, post secularization uh, line of missions or bulwarks um, is possibly one of them because you can't tell where, where they're intending to put the Carrillo family when they arrive. Maybe that, maybe that idea of where they were gonna place them changed and uh, there was something being built on the site and then it, it was then transferred and became the family's home. And so uh, it's, a, it's a pretty complex Thing and not to even touch on uh, Vallejo's relationship with the missionaries and secularization. And that's a complicated and uh, um, story as well, because of course it was to Vallejo's benefit to obfuscate land that might have been solidly belonging to the, to the mission. <laughs> uh, so that plays a role in the, the uh, fuzziness, the uncertainty of what buildings actually existed and where they were. Uh, it's really, you know, pretty, pretty fascinating stuff and certainly worth continued research like uh, he's pointing out. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, 
Um, Linda Creo Strut, uh, I apologize if I mispronounce uh, that, that Strut there, um, has provided us this information and, and with a question, uh, just kind of reiterating that you stated the Adobe was used as a general store, a post office and an inn, and kind of making that inference uh, that if the given structure was used for a variety of businesses, maybe that substantial foundation that was discovered may, was to be intended yet as another business, maybe even a hotel. Um, it, archaeologically, <laughs> you know, yeah, we, I, you, you touched on these digs, you know, the yeah, very, yeah. the small one, but um, what kind of other information, you know, was, is that something that might be found out at some point in time? Could it yes. still be found out if an archeological dig was to happen there? Well, I, I think, I mean, that's a logical thing, totally logical thing to suggest about, about the usage, but I think it's pretty well understood from the archeological, the way things are layered and what you can tell about the site that uh, those larger footings are not, of a construction type, I think that would have happened in 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 that later period, uh, you know, in the eighteen fifties. And so it does seem reasonably clear that at those two sites that I showed, you have the Korea Adobe site and that one that was farther to the west. That was likely the site of the the baptism that was the um, not the romantic version that was made up, but was the the naming uh, of Santa Rosa on the Western side, it's clear there were other buildings there. Uh, and I think it, you're, I think uh, Bill Roop, who was the archeologist, I think he was able to tell that there were, uh, that some of those footings were simply never built on. Um, and then that other things were built simultaneously. So it's much, I think it's much more likely that there was what those foundations are, either something that was never built on that was either built in the uh, 1820s uh, and then abandoned or perhaps a, a little bit later um, if we kind of stretch that timeline with when uh, the Carrillo family might have occupied um, the space. So I think archeologically it's understood that it has probably not uh, foundations for a business that would have been built in uh, say the 1850s, mm -hmm. you know, the early 1850s or very late 1840s. I think it's pretty clear archeologically that those things are 1820s or 1830s, those, those foundations, so. So when you say 1830s and 1820s and 1830s, are you meaning 1920s and 30s? Because you no, kind of- No, I think if I time. understand the question, she's asking about the those foundations that were discovered because yeah. in, so in 2007 or whenever that, that excavation, these the stone footings were then discovered that were never really under, hadn't been well understood or known that they were there, were in that time period discovered. And those footings, those foundations that of stone are far too big for the, the width of wall that was the Carrillo adobe. They can't, they can't have been intended for that. And they were most certainly built earlier than the, the American period, than the 1840s or 50s, as say an add-on business to the, uh, to the hotel or the, um, you know, the post office or whatever. So I think that, that can be excluded uh, our, as I understand it from, um, not being an archaeologist, so I can't, okay. but, no, uh, no, but that's yeah. my answer. And that, thank you for clearing that up because by predating, you know, you're predating or the archaeologist was predating those, those the, the wide, wide stones um, and the footings, uh, it, was, it just became a little confusing, like, wait a second, they're bigger, they're predated, you know, so yeah. Um, right. yeah. So the, yes, the idea being that the, the intent was to build something bigger, but then that did not happen. Mm, okay, all right. So um, we're getting a, a, a good number of kudos and thank yous um, for an interesting presentation. So pass those on to you and folks are uh, enjoying hearing about the multiple perspectives around the Adobe. Um, and it sounds like, like you said, uh, that you didn't do a deep dive into every you know, every facet 
of the Adobe. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> but that brings me to a question, um, you know, with the Museum of Sonoma County, uh, you know, I know that you've had, I, I seem to recall that you've had an uh, uh, exhibit about the Adobe and, and, and whatnot. Um, is that something that you would bring back? Is that something that would revisit? Oh, abso absolutely. Okay. And, and in fact, it's, it's part of, uh, um, and I have to, well, maybe a, a quick call out here to, uh, to an object, a recent, uh, recent acquisition uh, through um, um, kind of organized by uh, uh, Donna uh, Carrillo Endicott, one of, one of my favorite people. <laughs> who uh, who helped me a lot when I was doing a lot of, a lot of my writing? She helped uh, organize the donation of a trunk, uh, and this is, was kind of interesting to me that um, from the family that was uh, Maria Creo's trunk, and uh, even in the the kind of family memoir, there's a description of her preparing uh, to travel from San Diego up to Sonoma and putting all her finery and her clothes in seven Spanish trunks, uh, which is a great description of it. So it's interesting because we took the, the, this trunk in and then we happen to have another trunk, a smaller trunk, that the story with that is that it was uh, part of the Russian uh, movement into, into America across through uh, Alaska and that it served as a step into a uh, into a home in the one of the fur trading outposts of, that the Russians established uh, up in Alaska and eventually made its way uh, down here. Well, both of those trunks with those varying stories um, have identical uh, painting motifs, absolutely 100% identical. And so we did uh, a little bit of research on those. It turns out they're not they're not Russian nor Spanish. They're Chinese uh, uh, mass production uh, trunks, but that they both wound their way uh, to Sonoma County and ended up here. Uh, it tells you something about the shape of the world at the time and trade and all of those things. So even though they're not, you know, Spanish trunks that should, I, I think uh, paired with that other trunk. So uh, this is a very long way to say, <laughs> <laughs> we actually have that on display now and uh, uh, have uh, information about the Adobe. So absolutely, yes. I mean, I would be my, I would love to do, uh, find the right context or the right set of um, objects or reason to do a, a really big um, exhibition about the whole thing. I, I think that's, that would be an absolute natural and I would love to do it. <laughs> maybe we can, maybe we can start the Adobe days. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Should, should do Adobe Days. There we go. There we go. Um, and, and with that, I just want to give you a quick second to uh, mention uh, if people want to see that trunk or anything else at the museum, now that we're back open here in California, uh, what are your hours at the museum? What, how can folks uh, come in and say hello? Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're now, we're, you know, we're like a lot of places just coming back, you know, on online, but we're open uh, weekend uh, hours. So just Saturday and Sunday, uh, 11 to five. So you can, you can come on by and, and check out uh, the space. We have both uh, the old post office and the, the history space, the, uh, the art gallery uh, and our sculpture garden that are all open uh, and available on weekends. And we'll be slowly kind of upping, expanding our hours in the coming, you know, next two, three months, so. Great, yeah, definitely a, a great time to um, get a membership before the rush. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right? <laughs> Thanks. right? You're, you're welcome, you're welcome. Signing up as your marketing person soon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll so slip you that bill a later on. <laughs> and so with that, uh, talking about memberships, uh, I just want to make sure that we do mention uh, not only for Sylvia, but for, for many, many others that are out there, whether you're here with us on Zoom or on Facebook Live, or maybe a few days from now or weeks from now on YouTube, is that the Historical Society of Santa Rosa, you can see their uh, web, web address right there at www.historicalsocietysantarosa.org, uh, does have memberships 
available and you can uh, inquire about those on their website as well as they produce a newsletter. They have more, they'll have more upcoming events, I'm sure. Um, and this webinar series will continue uh, on July 15th. Uh, it's coming up the third Thursday in July at 6 p.m. The topic is houses moved into the St. Rose Preservation District. Uh, it's where I'm at right now in, uh, in my dwelling, in my adobe. And uh, it, that it will be presented by Denise Hill of the Historical Society of Santa Rosa, one of my neighbors right here. So uh, that is exciting to hear. It's a, it, it, it's a great neighborhood um, and it, it will be really fun to hear about those houses and that, that movement. Just a few weeks ago, uh, we had a presentation about uh, Highway 101 and displaced houses and, uh, you know, so this is, this is a great follow-up. Um, and we do have a question about that trunk and uh, where one, you know, oh. can, can visit to see the trunk. And as we mentioned, it was at the museum, maybe even share um, where the museum is located for those who may not know. Sure, well, we're right downtown Santa Rosa uh, on 7th Street, uh, 425 7th Street here, right across from the, the mall, the <laughs> Santa Rosa Plaza Mall, so. <laughs> Right, right. in that historic building, right? Yes, in the old Santa Rosa post, talking about buildings that have been moved, yes, right? So uh, this building was moved to be saved. So yeah, come come visit us here in the, the old post office building. Great, well, I think that we've gone through all the questions except for one, a second question from Bill. I wanted to give him uh, that last spot. So this is our last question for, for the evening. And uh, Bill had, um, another question is, I find it right here, what is the current update on the Barry Swinson's construction and plans for the Adobe? I, I know that we've talked a lot about uh, different um, plans and, and, and whatnot, but do you happen to have any information on that? Well, the latest, what I said, what the latest thing was that he, um, I mean, my understanding is that the proposal uh, was put forward again through a, a new program uh, that would fast track developments. I think in, I don't know if that's partly in the aftermath of, uh, of COVID and all of that and it, or to you know, stimulate uh, additional housing. And it was put forward under that program, but it was declined. So, it, so that essentially, still in limbo. <laughs> that's, oh, I mean, yeah. that's, that's the update. So, um, so that's pretty recent. So, um, I mean, it's not a very exciting, <laughs> exciting update, but that, but that's the current situation as, as I understand it. Well, maybe a little bit more positive of an update than if it had gone through, right? So, um, as far as developing sure. that area. So, um, maybe, maybe this will lend itself to yet another attempt at, at true preservation. Um, and, uh, and, and our Historical Society of Santa Rosa's uh, president, uh, Brian Mulch says Adam Ross had been with the city uh, as a planner at the time and it was to be resubmitted. So uh, we'll, we'll right. you that's, know, again- It hasn't yet, okay, maybe that's slightly different. So stay yeah, tuned. <laughs> so, uh, again, folks, if you are out there listening to us, whether you're here on Zoom or you're on Facebook Live, uh, please contact the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. As you can see from tonight, uh, they are uh, the members of the Historical Society of Santa Rosa are uh, diverse and full of great information about Santa Rosa. And uh, many of your questions can be answered not only by the members, but also looking back through their newsletters, looking on their website, uh, using them as a resource. And remember, they do have a Facebook page that you can keep up on information as well. And they share great stories and great information. Many times, what you'll see in the paper originated with some information at the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. So um, I want to thank Eric Stanley, once again, for being here and uh, for bringing all of that information, all of those great stories together tonight.
so that we could have them in one place and, and again, preserve them because this uh, event will be, uh, it's being recorded right now and it'll be posted on YouTube. So folks can go back and watch it again, even if they miss something or wanna see some of those photos. I know folks wanted to see those photos again. So go back and, and watch it on, on YouTube. Eric, uh, you probably, do you have the day off tomorrow? It's Juneteenth. Is the <laughs> museum open or closed? Uh, museum's closed. Okay. I'm at work. <laughs> okay. All right. I, right before we went on live tonight, I got a text that the Santa Rosa City Schools, the camps, the school district offices and things like that are closed. So folks do look for those updates. It's very exciting news tonight to talk about history. Yeah. Juneteenth became a national Absolutely. holiday today and tomorrow some of our uh, federal offices and others are gonna be closed. So uh, go out there, find that information, resource the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. Join us July 15th on Thursday night at six o'clock uh, for houses moved into the St. Rose Preservation District with Denise Hill of the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. At this time, we are going to be signing off tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us on Facebook Live as well. And we'll see you on YouTube during, for this recording. All right, Eric. Good night. Thank you.